or otherwise called oral hypoglycemic agents. The better terminology is actually OADs, oral anti-diabetic uh, agents or drugs, because we want to bring down uh, sugars to euglycemic levels. Okay, we don't want to induce hypoglycemia. So probably the better term that we need to use is OADs. So it is a brief overview. Okay, so diabetes is such a common uh, problem in our country. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that India is not just the second most populated country when it comes to the burden of diabetes or the number of diabetic patients. Also, India is the second most, uh, second country, you know, the maximum, I think after China only, uh, in the total population, even in the number of diabetics. Okay, so India probably has about uh, 20, more than 20% of uh, uh, world diabetes burden is in India. Okay, so, you, I'm sure you're aware that you know there is something called type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, obviously, the choice is uh, insulin. They don't respond to, uh, there's no oral option available. But type 2 diabetes, they usually respond to oral uh, anti-diabetic agents. Uh, most of them do respond. Some of them may require addition of insulin besides uh, oral anti-diabetic drugs. So this talk is going to be a brief overview of what you know, the various types, what are the types of anti-diabetic drugs available, their mechanism of action, uh, and the common dosages, you know, when are they indicated, contraindicated. It's going to be a brief overview. Uh, and in the end, if you have any questions, like, you know, and then you can uh, ask me or we can discuss a few case scenarios if time permits. Okay. So we know that insulin and glucagon regulate normal glucose homeostasis. Uh, in fed state, what happens to blood glucose? It increases. Okay, and this blood glucose increased uh, blood glucose levels that stimulates pancreas to produce insulin, and then insulin in in turn increases glucose uptake by uh, muscles and other tissues and reduces gluconeogenesis. Uh, reduces Doctor, glucose output. Uh, yeah. small request uh, yeah. that is not playing in a full screen. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I'll switch to animation. I, sure, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, the, sure. yeah, that. yeah. So the insulin uh, in turn reduces glucose uptake, sorry, increases glucose uptake by muscle, adipose tissue, etc. and reduces glucose output from the liver, thereby bringing down the glucose level. Glucagon does the opposite. It increases glucose output from the liver. Okay, so what are the major pathophysiologic defects in type 2 diabetes? We know there is uh, insulin resistance and insulin deficiency, right? So the, there is a dysfunction of islet cells, that is beta cells of pancreas, which produce insulin, right? So there is islet cell uh, dysfunction, there is increase in glucagon levels, there is reduction in insulin levels. It is not just reduction in insulin levels. There is insulin resistance also at the level of tissues. Insulin that is there is not able to act effectively okay, at the tissue level. Okay, so basically there is reduction in, uh, there is insulin defect, be it the level of insulin uh, being low or insulin increase in insulin resistance. And that is the first defect. And second is, uh, there is reduced uptake of glucose by the tissues from the blood. And third is there is increased glucose output from the liver. These are the uh, three main, main defects, pathophysiological defects that result in hyperglycemia. Okay, so this was the traditional triad that, you, that we used to uh, discuss, you know, uh, resulting in diabetes. What is, what is the pathophysiology of diabetes? Maybe... A decade back, we used to talk about this triad. But now, from this traditional uh, triad, now with more uh, knowledge we have, now we talk about this ominous octet. There are about eight 
defects, pathophysiological defects that result in hyperglycemia in patients with diabetes. So there is decreased insulin secretion, which we've already talked about, which we know, and there is increased glucagon secretion, which also we are, uh, we've already talked about. And the third one, increased glu uh, glucose production from the liver, which again is the result of uh, in reduction in insulin levels and increase in glucagon levels. Not just these three, these are the traditional uh, pathophysiological defects we used to talk about earlier, but now we know that there are many more aspects to diabetes. There is neurotransmitter dysfunction in the brain. Uh, there is decreased uptake of glucose by peripheral tissues. And there is increased, uh, there is a reduction in glucose uh, reabsorption. Sorry, there is increased glucose reabsorption in the kidney and also increased lipolysis. And there is something called reduction in incretin effect. Okay, so I'll be talking about what incretins are in due course of time. So these, these eight uh, defects uh, are the pathophysiological defects that are present in a patient with diabetes, which leads to hyperglycemia. So these are the eight defects which we just talked about. So there is decreased insulin, incretin effect, there is decreased insulin secretion, there is increased glucagon secretion, there's increased glucose reabsorption, decreased glucose uptake in the tissues, especially skeletal muscle. There's increased hepatic glucose production. There's increased lipolysis and there is neurotransmitter dysfunction. Okay, so now let's just quickly uh, move on to the core topic, the oral diabetic agents. So where do they act? So there are these various uh, aspects of diabetes. You know, there are defects and some of these drugs act at some of these levels at some of these uh, defects. So sulfonylureas and meglitonide analogs. Sulfonylureas are insulin secretocogs. They stimulate pancreas and improve insulin secretion. Similarly, meglitonides also are uh, insulin, they are insulin secretocogs, but they are not sulfonylureas. They belong to a different category. And then there are Drugs called thiozolidin dions, for example, pioglitazone. Okay, they uh, reduce the uh, glucose output from the liver and also enhance uh, you know glucose uptake by the muscle. And there is metformin, which is one of the oldest uh, oral hypoglycemic agents that we have. The first one that was available in market was in 1960s, that was sulfonylurea. Then it was metformin. This metformin basically reduces uh, gluconeogenesis and decreases the glucose output from the liver into the circulation. And there is a group of uh, oral anti-diabetic agents called alpha glucose inhibitors, which act at the gut level, okay, and then reduce uh, glucose absorption from the gut. Okay, so there are other newer uh, oral diabetic agents like DPP-4 inhibitors, okay, uh, which again uh, reduce uh, glucose out, uh, output from the liver and enhance insulin secretion. So what are the glycemic targets? I'll be talking about each class of oral anti-diabetic agents in the next one or two minutes. But before we do that, we, we treat our patients with diabetes to bring down the sugar levels, right? So for, uh, I'm sure you know how we diagnose uh, diabetes, right? What is a fasting level sugar? What should be the HbA1c? What should be the postprandial or uh, sugar uh, to make a diagnosis of diabetes? I'm not really going into basics like oral glucose tolerance test how we interpret OGTT to make a diagnosis of diabetes. So fasting blood sugar in a patient, if it's above 125, then it falls into diabetic range, postprandial sugar, or after giving 75 uh, grams of glucose, if you check sugar after two hours, if it's above 200, then again, 
that is the criteria for diagnosing diabetes, HbA1c 6.5 or more. So when we treat our patients for diabetes, the target fasting blood sugar we are looking at, at least it should be below 130. Post-prandial sugar, preferably below 160. And HbA1c, it should be below 6.5 or below 7, depending on the age, etc. So this slide kind of summarizes various uh, oral hypoglycemic agents or anti-diabetic agents we have. Metformin, which is the first line of drug. You know, that is most guidelines recommend metformin as the uh, first choice. If somebody is newly diagnosed to have type 2 diabetes, then if you have to choose a drug, choose metformin. That should be the first drug because metformin is does not act by uh, enhancing insulin secretion because we know that by the time a patient is diagnosed to have diabetes, there's uh, islet cell, 50% of beta cells are gone and there is less insulin uh, producing capacity. And if you use uh, secretagogues like sulfonylureas, et cetera, which stimulate insulin, there'll be further loss of beta cell mass. So metformin acts by reducing uh, glucose output from the liver. So it conserves beta cell function. And uh, there is no risk of hypoglycemia, uh, risk of hypoglycemia with metformin. Metformin, patients on metformin uh, may maintain the same weight Metformin is a, a either weight neutral or sometimes patients lose weight. It does not result in weight gain. The maximum dosage uh, per day of metformin is three grams per day. It can be given as twice daily or thrice daily. In a patient with creatinine above 1.8, it's better to avoid metformin because there is a theoretically there is increased risk of uh, lactic acidosis. So in patients with uh, liver dysfunction, again, it's better to avoid metformin. What are the common side effects of uh, metformin? It is gastrointestinal side, uh, side effects, nausea, bloating, sometimes diarrhea. Okay. And then there are sulfonylureas. So the older sulfonylurea that is still available in market is glibenclamide, otherwise called gliburide. Brand names are like Gianil, then glipizide, then glicleside and glimepiride are newer sulfonylureas. Okay, so these drugs are insulin secretagogues. So they stimulate pancreatic beta cells to produce insulin. So with long-term usage of sulfonylureas, there will be further loss of beta cell function. They do not conserve beta cell function. And of course, the uh, patients on sulfonylureas are at risk of developing hypoglycemia because there is increased insulin production. And they all, all the sulfonylureas be it glibenclamide, glipizide, uh, gliclazide, or glibeparide, cause weight loss. Okay. So the maximum dosages are mentioned here. Okay. The glibenclamide maximum, we start around 2.5 mg, uh, one to two times per day. You can go up to 20 milligrams per day. Glipizide, the maximum dosage allowed is 20 milligrams per day. Glyclozide 320 milligrams per day and glimiparate 8 milligrams. That is a maximum dosage. And it is better to avoid the glibenclamide if somebody's creatinine is above 1.5. Otherwise, they're at risk of prolonged hypoglycemia. Okay. And glipizide and glyclozide can be used up to creatinine of 2.5. They don't cause renal impairment or worsen renal function, but in patients with renal impairment, their duration of action is prolonged and the patients are at risk of increased risk of hypoglycemia. Okay. And then side effects of uh, sulfonylureas are weight gain and hypoglycemia. Okay. So coming to pyoglitazone and uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, I'll be talking about in subsequent slides.